Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of 29-year-old Linnell Barsock, who was murdered on June 16, 2010, in Palmdale, California. That day, her friend came over to do her hair, but she said she left when Linnell and her boyfriend started arguing. When she came back, she found Linnell shot to death in the garage of the home that she shared with her boyfriend. Suspicion immediately fell on him when police began to dig deeper into Linnell's life. But after he was arrested, investigators learned the truth about who really murdered Linnell. And the truth was more shocking than they ever imagined. This is Linnell's story. Whenever I tell a story that has been solved... I always look for the lesson that can be learned from what happened to the women in the story. I feel like if I'm going to retell a story about the worst thing that happened to someone and their family, then there needs to be a reason. So when I heard about Linnell's story, her murder, the lesson that I took from it was that you have to be careful about who you allow in your life. It shows how quickly a friendship or relationship can go from love to infatuation to jealousy, to murder. Linnell was young and successful, enjoying her life in Palmdale, California, where she was a nurse. At 29, she had built a life for herself that most people would be proud of. But in the summer of 2010, she was brutally gunned down in the garage of her own home. She died in a senseless act of violence, but the truth about her murder makes this story a truly shocking one. Linnell was born on July 27, 1980, and grew up in South Los Angeles. She was the middle child with two older siblings and two younger ones. Her mom, Bobby, told Crime Stoppers that as a child, she was quiet, but she was also busy. Her older brother, Jerome, said that she was the glue that held their family together, the peacemaker, the mediator. In school, She was an honor roll student in both elementary school and high school. Her mom said that she always really liked school. After graduating from Crenshaw High School in 1998, she went to Cal State Long Beach for about a year and a half. And while in school there, she began working at two hospitals and then decided to enroll in a nursing program where she studied to become a licensed vocational nurse. People who knew her best said that she was the kind of person who always wanted to help people, and so a career as a nurse was fitting. After working for a while as a vocational nurse, Linnell decided that she wanted to go back to school so that she could become a registered nurse. According to her family and friends, Linnell had always been really ambitious, and so it was no surprise that she was able to achieve the goals that she set for herself. But it wasn't all work for Linnell she had a healthy social life too. Her friends say that she was kind-hearted and someone that you just enjoyed being around. In 2006, Linnell met Lewis. According to Dateline, which featured her story earlier this year, Lewis had immigrated to the United States from Haiti in 2005 and was taking ESL classes at the same school where Linnell was taking her nursing classes. One day, while she was driving home, She saw Lewis at the bus stop and offered him a ride. Not long after that, the two began dating, and it didn't take long for their relationship to become really serious. Friends of theirs said that they could see in the beginning that they really did love each other. Eventually, Linnell and Lewis moved in together. She began working at a clinic in L.A., and Lewis worked for the city of Hawthorne, California, as a maintenance worker. In 2009, the couple decided to purchase a home together. They settled on a beautiful three-bedroom home in Palmdale, California. At that point, everything was coming together for Linnell. 
She had a successful career doing what she loved, and she had just purchased a home. But sometimes, as some things fall into place, other things fall apart. By the time Linnell and Lewis had moved into their new home, they had been together for a few years. But according to a friend of Linnell's who spoke with Dateline, he said that not long after they purchased their home, the couple's relationship began to hit a rough patch. Linnell had begun to confide in her close friends that she was having issues with Lewis. There had been talks about getting married, but it seemed like now Linnell no longer wanted to get married and was questioning whether she even wanted to stay with Lewis. But despite their issues, the couple continued to live together. Linnell, however, began to explore other options. And even though she still lived with Lewis, she had begun dating another man. It was a relationship that she attempted to, of course, keep from Lewis. And the other man had given her a cell phone that she could use to communicate with him. It's not exactly clear what Linnell's ultimate plan was, but I'm sure the fact that she and Lewis had purchased that home together made it more complicated for her. She could just break up with him, but that wasn't going to be easy. And Lewis wasn't just some passive guy. He had an aggressive side. Linnell's mom said that one time she called her hysterical because she said Lewis tried to run her off the road. According to her mom, she had told him that she was leaving him, and when she got in her car and left, he allegedly chased her down and tried to run her car off the road. There had also been at least one incident between the two where the cops had been called. Family and friends of Linnell said that Lewis did have a jealous side. And so if that was the case, then that would add to the complications of trying to break up with him while they lived together. Relationships, however, can be complicated. And although there were issues in theirs, it's hard to know exactly what is going on in someone's relationship especially when they lived together. By the summer of 2010, it had been a year and a half since Linnell and Lewis had purchased their home. And Linnell had plans of turning the home into an adult daycare facility so she could own her own business. But that, like everything else Linnell had planned, would never happen. On June 16th, 2010, Linnell had planned for her friend, Lorraine Austin, to come over to her house to do her hair. She had started the day before. She was doing a sew-in, but she hadn't finished. And so she was coming over the next day to finish. And she arrived at Linnell's around 10 a.m. and began doing her hair. But not long after, Linnell and Lewis started arguing. Apparently, Lewis had found the phone that her other boyfriend had given her and confronted her about it. Detectives told Dateline that Lewis had been told that the phone didn't have any minutes on it, but had found out that it was a lie and someone had put minutes on the phone. That's when he confronted Linnell and an argument began. Now, in an attempt to end the argument and let things cool off, Linnell and Lorraine decided that they were going to leave and go to the hair store to get a few things. Linnell hoped that by leaving, she could help, you know, squash the argument. But Lewis followed them to the hair store. And once again, he confronted Linnell about her secret cell phone. She decided that she would just give him the phone, hoping that he would be satisfied and that he would leave. And he did leave. After he pulled off, the women went over to pick up a pizza that they ordered from a local pizza store, and then they got a couple of drinks from a different store before heading back to the house. And when they arrived at around 12 p.m., Lewis was there. And according to Lorene, the couple started to argue again. Six hours later, Lorraine showed up at the police station and told them that she had just found her friend dead in her garage. She told police that she had been at her friend's home earlier that day and that she had been arguing with her boyfriend, and so she decided to leave. 
Lorraine said that when she came back to the house, she found her friend lying in a pool of blood with a plastic bag over her head. It sounded like an unbelievable story, but Lorraine had blood all over her. She said that she slipped in it when she went into the garage and found Linnell. And so police knew that something had happened. Immediately, they left the station and followed the rain to Linnell's home. And inside the garage, just as Lorraine said, they found Linnell dead on the floor of the garage next to her car. And she had a plastic bag over her head. There was blood everywhere. Police lifted the bag off of Linnell's head, but because of the amount of blood, at first, they believed that she had been hit in the head and beaten to death. It was a horrific scene, and whoever had done this to Linnell had tried to cover up what they did, which made them rule out the likelihood that this was a home invasion or a robbery. And even initially, police could tell that there was no signs of forced entry. But they could find signs that someone had tried to clean up the murder. When they looked at the home, at first, everything seemed normal. There was no sign of a struggle, nothing really out of place. Except, in the living room, they could tell that there had been a large area rug covering the carpet. And that it had been moved because the mark the rug left was still there. Now, usually, when a rug has been moved at a crime scene, It's usually a clue that the rug either had evidence on it or that someone was going to use the rug to move a body. After they looked over the living room, they made their way to the laundry room where they found several towels covered in blood. It was obvious that someone was definitely trying to clean up that scene. Now, while investigators continued to process the scene at Linnell's house, back at the station, they continued talking to Lorraine to find out what happened that day. According to detectives, when she came into the station initially, Lorraine was hysterical and emotional. To them, she was acting like most people would expect from a woman who just found her friend dead. Lorraine told detectives that they had been friends for 10 years, and so it was no wonder that she appeared to be so upset. She began to tell them about what happened that day. She told them about Lewis and Linnell arguing and that they had been all day. She said that he had found out that Linnell was cheating on him. And so that's what they had been arguing about and had been for days. Lorraine said that after they got back from the hair store, that Linnell and Lewis continued to argue and that it made her uncomfortable. So she decided that she would just leave and go for a walk. She said that when she came back a few hours later, that's when she found Linnell dead. She then told police that when she was in the garage, she heard a noise coming from upstairs. And when she looked at the top of the stairs, she saw Lewis. She said she was so scared that she ran out of the house and she couldn't find her cell phone to call 911. So she just drove straight to the police station. The story that Lorraine told investigators was shocking, but not surprising because when a woman is murdered like Linnell was, her boyfriend or spouse is usually the first suspect. And what Lorraine had described painted the picture of a jealous boyfriend who was in a rage when she left her friend with him. And so police began to take a closer look at Lewis and his relationship with Linnell. And what they learned was unsettling. It wasn't long before Lewis was their prime suspect and all eyes were on him. But everything isn't always as it seems. And as investigators dug deeper and deeper, they began to see that this case was more disturbing than they ever could have imagined. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. I know I can't be the only one that wished that life came with a manual sometimes, but unfortunately, it doesn't. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. 
Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient and accessible anywhere, 100% online. Therapy has so many benefits, and BetterHelp makes it so easy to access a therapist. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash girlgone. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash girlgone. Gifting is hard. Bombas makes it easy with socks, underwear, and t-shirts that feel good and do good. They feel good because they're thoughtfully designed with the softest materials. And they do good because for every item you purchase, Bombas donates another to someone in need. Bombas socks are so comfortable. And the fact that they donate a pair of socks or underwear to someone in need is really an incredible mission. Bombas socks, underwear, t-shirts, and slippers are cozy upgrades to everyday basics and the perfect gift for everyone on your list, including yourself. Bombas uses materials like premium Pima cotton and ultra-soft, never-itchy merino wool in their socks and t-shirts and fuzzy Sherpa lining in their slippers. Bombas holiday collection puts a modern twist on traditional festive colors and designs. Think rich purples and greens, geometric snowflake designs, sweater-inspired textures, and retro ski patterns. With family sets, you can match with your family and friends in exceptional comfort and style. Hello, frameable holiday photo. And did you know that socks, underwear, and t-shirts are the three most requested clothing items in homeless shelters? That's why Bombas donates one item for every item that you buy. So far, Bombas has donated over 75 million items of clothing. That's a whole lot of comfort and a whole lot of good. Give the good this holiday season with Bombas. Go to bombas.com slash girlgone and use code girlgone for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash girlgone. Code girlgone for 20% off. Bombas.com slash girl gone. Code girl gone. On June 16, 2010, Linnell Barsock was found dead in the garage of her home. She and her boyfriend, Louis, had been fighting that day. Her friend Lorraine was there that day because she had come over to do Linnell's hair. She said that she left when the couple continued to fight, but When she came back a few hours later, she found Linnell dead with a plastic bag over her head. From the start, police were sure this was not a robbery or a home invasion, but instead was committed by someone close to Linnell. As they began to investigate, suspicion soon fell directly on Lewis, and police began to zero in on him. After police began speaking with Lorraine, the story that she told about the argument that Linnell had with her boyfriend led police to believe that Lewis was probably the one who committed this murder. It seemed like a pretty open and shut case, but they would need to speak to Lewis first to get his side of the story. Ironically, Lewis was at Linnell's mom's house. She told Crime Stoppers that the couple would often stay at her house when they were in L.A. and they didn't feel like driving back to Palmdale. 
And so that night, Bobby, Linnell's mom, said that she got a call from a detective asking her if Lewis was there. And he was. So she said she knocked on the door of the room where he was and told him that someone was on the phone for him. Bobby said that she listened in on the conversation and overheard Lewis ask if this was about Linnell. At the time, Bobby had no idea that she was just moments away from getting the worst news that a mother could ever receive. Not long after speaking to Lewis, police arrived at Bobby's home to take him into the station. And that's when Bobby found out that her daughter was dead. Lewis was taken into custody that night, and police investigators began to interrogate him. When they spoke to Lewis, he denied having anything to do with Linnell's murder. They asked him about what happened that day, and he admitted that he and Linnell had been arguing. He also admitted that he followed the two women to the hair store where the argument continued. However, he claimed that shortly after Linnell and Lorraine arrived back at the house, that he left to head to L.A. where he was meeting Lorraine's boyfriend, who was supposed to be fixing his car. He said he left around 12.30 p.m. And then once in L.A., he and Lorraine's boyfriend went to a few auto parts stores to get the items that he needed for his car. But police did not believe Lewis. In an interview with Crime Watch Daily, one of the detectives said that Lewis was crying, but there were no tears. He kept saying, you have to find the murderer, but police believed that they had him. The story that Lorraine gave them was more convincing than the one Lewis gave, and detectives noticed that he also had a scratch on his face, which they figured must have happened during the murder. Now, while police continued to question Lewis, back at the crime scene, police were collecting a lot of evidence. An autopsy had been performed and it had been determined that Linnell had been shot, and they knew that she had been shot from a downward angle. Inside the house, they found a pillow that had been used as a silencer, and they used luminol to find blood. And the investigators said that there was blood all over the house. The luminol testing showed that someone had tried to clean up the crime scene and that Linnell had been murdered inside the house, and then the body was drug into the garage. There was a trail of blood that led from the living room through the kitchen and laundry room to the garage where the body was found. Inside Linnell's car that was in the garage, they found more blood, including plastic sheets that were covered in blood. There was also a bunch of garbage in the trunk, too. The evidence was almost overwhelming for detectives. With everything that they were finding, it was going to be an easy case to prove. They even found a Dear John letter that further corroborated the story that Lorraine had told them about another man being in Linnell's life. On the fridge, they found a handwritten note, and it read, Dear Lewis, I'm leaving you for Ike. He makes more money, so you can do what you like with the house. I'm moving out of the state with Ike, so that's why I gave you the phone. We're getting married, so just leave me alone. You can have everything in the house. I have been sleeping with him for four months. He's the one that pays my car note, so good luck in life. The letter was signed, Goodbye, Linnell. And there was also a P.S. that said, I'm taking one of the TVs, but that part had been scratched out. Now, even before the lab testing from the evidence collected came back, police were becoming more and more convinced that Lewis was the killer. Now, they were aware that Linnell had been seeing someone else. I mean, even the letter they found spoke about another man, and so they needed to clear him as a suspect before they could proceed. And so they spoke to him, and he was cleared as a suspect. It was yet another step towards charging Lewis with murder. Forensic teams continued to process the scene, and 
Lewis remained in police custody. Investigators impounded Lewis's car and began searching for more evidence, hoping to find blood or even better, the actual murder weapon, which they knew was a 9mm. But as they searched Lewis's vehicle, the things that they were finding were not the things that they expected to find. Inside the truck, they found several receipts for different auto parts stores in L.A., and the receipts were dated June 16th, the day of the murder. Now, that could have meant that he had gone to the store after he brutally murdered his girlfriend, but there was one problem. The timestamps on the receipts all matched the time that the murder was committed. The detectives were surprised and confused. Lorraine told them that when she left the house, that Lewis was there. And when she came back a few hours later, he was still there. And the timeline that they had said that Linnell was murdered during the time that the receipts in Lewis's vehicle placed him miles away at a store. Now, what had started off as what police thought was going to be an open and shut case of domestic violence was starting to become cloudy. Detectives decided that they would go to the stores on the receipts to see if they could find witnesses or surveillance footage. When detectives went to L.A. and visited the stores, they were able to secure surveillance footage from two different stores. Both stores had images of Lewis inside and outside the store around the time that Linnell was murdered. It was further proof that the story that Lewis had told them during his initial interview was, in fact, what happened. But was it possible that he could have gone to the store and then made it back in enough time to kill Linnell? Well, according to the detectives, that didn't seem possible at all. The stores where Lewis had been were in South Los Angeles, And they say that there's no way to make it from South L.A. to Palmdale quickly, no matter what time of day it is. And so despite their initial certainty that Lewis had committed this murder, this new evidence that they found was pointing in a completely different direction. Lewis was not the killer. So who was? Who killed Linnell? Well, police began to take a closer look at her friend Lorraine. After all, Lorraine was their star witness. She was the one who had found Linnell, and she was the one there that day to witness the fight. In fact, she was the reason why police initially suspected Lewis in the first place. However, the evidence that they found in Lewis's car and then on their surveillance camera footage put Lorraine's story into doubt. And so detectives began to take a closer look at Lorraine. And what they learned turned this case upside down. Now, even before police found the evidence that proved Lewis was not the killer, there had been some odd things that happened concerning Lorraine. The first odd thing that happened was when Lorraine first came into the police station to report Linnell's murder. She had allowed police to search her car and her purse. And inside her purse, they found two bullets. But when they questioned her, they said that she had a reasonable explanation for having the bullets. Then, while police were doing their initial investigation... They spoke to family members of Linnell's, including her parents and siblings. But during their interviews with them, detectives told them about Linnell's friend Lorraine finding her and the story that she had told about that day. But there was a problem. Nobody in Linnell's family knew who Lorraine was. Now, Lorraine said that she had been friends with Linnell for 10 years. Nobody in her family had ever met Lorraine. The day of the murder, Bonnie, Linnell's mom, recalled to Crime Stoppers that after detectives told her her daughter had been murdered, she went to the station to answer some questions, and her son Jerome 
went with her. She said that she was standing in the hallway with her son and the detective when a woman that she had never seen before came up to her, covered in blood, and hugged her. It was Lorraine. She said Lorraine told her that she was sorry for her loss, and when Bobby asked her who she was, she told her that she had gone to high school with Linnell. But Bobby had never met Lorraine, and knew nothing about her daughter being friends with her. Now, after detectives found evidence that corroborated Lewis's alibi, he was released from county jail, and detectives began to change their focus to a different suspect. Detectives needed to learn more about Linnell's friendship with Lorraine. It was really weird that none of her family knew this person that she had been friends with for 10 years. And so they began looking at Linnell's phone records, and what they found was unexpected. They learned from the messages that Linnell and Lorraine were more than just friends. They had also engaged in a sexual relationship. Detectives had no idea that Linnell and Lorraine were more than just friends, but The more they learned, the more the truth about what really happened came into focus. After finding the messages, detectives learned that Lorraine had not only lied about the true nature of her relationship with Linnell, she had lied about how they met and how long they knew each other. They didn't meet in high school, and they hadn't known each other for 10 years. Lorraine had only known Linnell for a few months, and they had met on Craigslist. Lorraine had placed an ad in the Women Seeking Women section of the site, and Linnell responded. After that, the two developed a relationship. It lasted for a few weeks, but Linnell decided that she just wanted to be friends with Lorraine. A week before she was murdered, She texts Lorraine that she no longer wanted to be intimate with her and she wanted to focus on her relationship with Lewis. In all of the conversations that detectives had with Lorraine, she never once mentioned anything about her and Linnell being more than just friends. After learning that Lorraine had lied to them, they asked her to take a lie detector test. And she agreed to take one, but then proceeded to avoid all attempts to give it. Fortunately, detectives were not going to need that lie detector test because when the DNA results came back from the evidence collected at the scene, detectives had everything they needed. Lorraine's DNA was found on a pair of bloody plastic gloves that had been found at the scene. And a pitcher that was used to clean up the blood also had her fingerprint on it. And that Dear John letter? Well a handwriting expert determined that Linnell had not written the letter. Lorraine did. Detectives now knew that Lorraine was their killer. And they believed that they knew why Lorraine had killed Linnell. They believed that she had become obsessed with her. Now, even though they had only known each other for a short period of time, she had become infatuated with everything about Linnell. Detectives believe that when Linnell broke off their romantic relationship, that Lorraine became angry and decided that she was going to kill Linnell. They said that she had come over that day under the guise of doing her hair, but while Linnell sat in the chair in her living room, Lorraine pulled out a gun and shot her in the back of the head. She then drug her body into the garage, where detectives say she attempted to put Linnell's body in the trunk of the car, but she couldn't. And that's when they say that she came up with a plan to pin the murder on Lewis. And Lorraine, according to detectives, wanted to be Linnell. It was more than just an attraction or a desire to be in a relationship with her. Lorraine wanted Linnell's life. Detectives believe that Lorraine's plan was to steal Linnell's money and car. They also learned that Lorraine had begun assuming Linnell's identity when she met other women. 
there was no doubt that Lorraine was the person responsible for Linnell's murder. She had tried to frame Lewis, and had he not had those receipts and the DNA had not been left behind, it might have worked. But the truth was now out, and an arrest warrant was issued for Lorraine's arrest. However, there was one big problem. Lorraine was gone. When she felt the doors closing in on her, she ran. And detectives had no idea where she was. Once it was discovered that Lorraine was gone, an all-out manhunt ensued. It was frustrating for both Linnell's family and detectives that worked the case. I mean, they knew who was responsible for this senseless murder, but they couldn't bring them to justice. But months after she went on the run, Lorraine was featured on the TV show America's Most Wanted. And after her appearance, tips began coming in, and detectives were led to the country of Belize, where they found Lorraine. In January 2012, a year and a half after she went on the run after being accused of killing Linnell, Lorraine was arrested. And a month later, she was extradited back to the United States to stand trial. Lorraine pleaded not guilty. And it took three years for her murder trial to begin. But despite her pleas of innocence, the jury did not believe her. And they found her guilty. She was sentenced to life in prison. And she must serve 50 years before she would be eligible for parole. She is currently serving her sentence inside a California prison. The shocking twist in this story was something investigators did not expect when they first started investigating this murder. They were convinced that Lewis was their suspect. But when they began to actually look at the evidence, they realized that the killer had been the one who walked into the station that day, covered in blood. Linnell's life ended in a brutal way. She did not deserve to die the way that she did. I know some people may listen to this episode and think about some of the choices that she made, but the one thing she did not choose was to be murdered by a woman that she had befriended and allowed in her home. She had no idea that after only a few weeks, Lorraine would become obsessed with her and then decide to kill her when she ended their friendship. Linnell had a life that Lorraine envied. She was young, she was beautiful, she was successful, and well-liked. And in June 2010, Lorraine took that from her. And now she will spend the rest of her life in prison. May Linnell Barsak rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. It also helps our show grow. As always, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. Is becoming Brianna T. Brianna T. Can you blame us for struggles with sobriety when they feel like all the talk is painted on we police get charged for the wall but not shooting she what the hell do you mean? God be a joke, man, it's gotta be a tease. Then you wanna watch how for us and get some sleep. When it come to cases of insomnia, yo, we leave. God damn. God damn. Black kids go missing at a higher rate than white ones. Than white ones. <laughs> not mine. How that there you got the right.